Welcome Hope Valley Church. Would you please stand and worship with us this morning?
nothing you can do. You're faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And when my heart burns, when you speak a word, it will come to pass. Great is your faithfulness to me. Great
above every name in heaven and earth. God, we just praise you this morning. We lift you high, Jesus. Thank you so much for all that you've done for us. We just thank you for your word that you've given us that we can follow after you. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. King Solomon was wiser and richer than any other king on earth. He loved God and God blessed him, but Solomon wanted more. He had many wives from different nations, and before long, Solomon's wives were able to turn him away from God. Solomon began to worship the false gods that his wives worshiped. He built altars on a hill near Jerusalem to worship idols. Then the people in Israel began to worship the false gods too. When this happened, God was angry. God said to Solomon, since you have done this, I will take the kingdom away from you and give it to your servant. You will be king the rest of your life, but when your son becomes king, he will lose everything except for one tribe. And that is exactly what happened. Solomon had a servant named Jeroboam. One day, a prophet named Ahijah met Jeroboam as he was coming down the road. Ahijah took off his coat and tore it into 12 pieces. Ahijah told Jeroboam, take 10 pieces for yourself. God is going to take the kingdom of Israel away from Solomon. He will let Solomon and his family keep a small part, but you will get the bigger part, 10 tribes. Ahijah said God was going to punish King David's descendants for their unfaithfulness, but their punishment would not last forever. When Solomon died, his son Rehoboam became king. The people did not want to serve a king like Rehoboam because he treated them so harshly. So they made Jeroboam king. The kingdom of Israel was now divided. Jeroboam ruled over the northern kingdom of Israel. Solomon's son only ruled over the southern kingdom of Judah. King Solomon's sin led to the division of the kingdom. God's people needed a better king. Through David's family, God would send his own son, Jesus, to be a perfect king over God's people forever. Jesus is greater than Solomon. Jesus brings his people together and leads them back to God. <laughs> Careful. Well, kiddos, you can carefully head to class. Um, what you see, what you just saw is um, we have uh, on Sunday mornings, uh, we, we played that one for those that are online and may not be able to be here to see in what our kids are walking through. So when we're walking through the scriptures up here, um, we have teachers as well that are walking our children through scriptures downstairs. Uh, you have the freedom to put your kids down there, keep your kids up here. It's, it's completely open. I do want to invite you, though, for next week. So next Sunday, we're going to have a, a sort of a special worship communion service up here. We're going to keep um, all the kids up here, so grade school kids will stay with us next week uh, instead of going down to, uh, to their classrooms. But we're going to have a guest. My brother is a worship pastor in North Carolina, also teaches at, at Southeastern Seminary in the worship department, and he's going to be coming and kind of helping uh, lead. He's actually going to walk with our worship team through some stuff on Saturday, and then he's going to be with us on Sunday as we just have a special time of worship. And, and please, I, I hope that you'll be here you won't want to miss it. It'll be a special time. We'll enjoy communion together as a church family, and we're just really looking forward to, uh, to doing that together. Um, so, And then one other quick last announcement is that the, uh, the grade school kids today, so parents, if you're picking them up, they're going to all be in one classroom, so not, not divide into two. They'll all be in the third to fifth grade class. So when you pick up your kids, uh, make sure you, uh, you go to that classroom. Um, so um, We had this weekend a sort of a marriage 
We didn't call it a retreat. We call it because you're not supposed to retreat from your spouse. We called it uh, sort of a marriage enrichment. Uh, when it was really, we're really thankful that we had that time together. Mickey and Laurie did a great job. We're thankful for you guys for putting that on and, and helping us walk through just some very practical uh, things for um, operating as husband and wife in the covenant of marriage. And uh, just really practical and really helpful. One thing that stuck, that stuck in my mind um, in, in that weekend was that the importance of having Christ in, you know, in your marriage, but Christ in your marriage doesn't make your marriage perfect. And here's what the statement was. Christ in your marriage doesn't make your marriage perfect, but it makes it hopeful. Uh, and so I think uh, as we sort of, some, as a, that's sort of a nugget that, I, that I'm clinging to as that, through that weekend, that we, we need Christ at the center and the focus of our marriages. And when we do, the storms don't go away, but we weather the storms because we're, our eyes are focused on him and we have hope because he's the anchor in the midst of the storms. And so thankful for, for you guys uh, and those of you who were able to make it. Well, go ahead and grab your Bibles, and uh, we are going to conclude our study in 2 Thessalonians. So we've we walked through 1 Thessalonians, and now we're concluding 2 Thessalonians today. Uh, I'm going to leave a little bit at the very end, and we're going to tie that up next week during our worship, uh, our worship service. Um, but we're in 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, so if you have your Bible, you can go ahead and start turning there. If you don't have one, we have one that you can have. Uh, you just need to see somebody in the back of the table, and we can get you a Bible to take home. Uh, or it'll also be up on the screen as well. So just find your place to 2 Thessalonians, and while you're finding it, um, do you guys remember Y2K? Anybody remember Y2K? Can y'all believe it was like, that was 22 years ago, which is hard for me to even wrap my mind around. Um, Y2K, for those of you, <laughs> the kids in here who have no clue what I'm talking about, when uh, the year 2000 and, the, and all the leading up to that, there became this sort of panic. Uh, and as I remember, because I think I was about 15 at the time, um, the way that I remember it, it was the, 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 the concern was that all the computers are going to crash and the financial systems are going to crash because of, the, of a date issue. And it was going to cause a computer glitch where when the clock turned over to 2000 it, and it was going to turn back to like 1900 and everything was just going to come crashing down. And I'm telling, I mean, it, this was like a, I mean, you guys were there, you remember it. it was, I mean, it was a wide, it was a big deal. In fact, there was like books that were written on it. You, you could still find some at the, at the Goodwill, which is, is funny. I almost bought one. But I didn't want to waste 50 cents, so I, uh, I didn't buy it. Um, but there's, uh, you know, like 2,000 ways to survive Y2K, you know, and then there was like all of these things in between. And now, uh, Y2K for dummies is one that I saw there on the shelf uh, before. And so, uh, but it didn't stop there because then the church jumped in on that. And so Christian leaders began to find ways to sell books and and, and pretty quickly, there was a, a, a rather large following that, that thought Jesus was going to return. That was like the end of the world, and this is when Jesus is going to come back. And so there was books written on, on that. And, uh, and so pretty quickly, there was uh, a lot of confusion around Y2K, which, again, if you remember, nothing ended up happening at all. I think there was a few like little minor glitches here and there, but nothing astronomical, nothing earth-shattering like they were thinking that maybe could happen. But I do remember there was so much that was happening, so much confusion that even me as a 15-year-old, we were, I remember we were at church and I, at the time and we were going to do like a pray in the new year thing. I remember we were praying and we were like, during like, I was like kind of watching the countdown, but we weren't doing a countdown because we were going to pray it in. We were super spiritual. We were going to pray in the new year. And I remember like, but in my mind, I was kind of watching and I was like watching it, watching it. And, and again, I knew it wasn't, I, I knew nothing was going to happen, but at the same time, I thought, well, what if? And so I was like, maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, like, something's about to happen. So I remember, like, we're praying. I'm, like, in my mind counting down. I'm waiting for the lights to shut off. I'm waiting for, like, I don't know, like, angels. I don't know. I was just waiting for something to happen because I had heard so many different things. And so many, and I actually, I heard of another group, I was, as I was reading this week, there was another group of Christians that actually, in the months leading up to Y2K, sold everything. They, they emptied their bank accounts. They sold their, uh, they, they cashed out their 401ks. They moved out. They quit their jobs. They moved out like these little like uh, gatherings or whatever you want to call them, waiting for Jesus to return. 
and he didn't, right? And so then they're like, oh, okay, so now, now what do we do? Like, we quit our jobs, and we cashed out all, like, now what are we gonna, what are we gonna do? I bring that up because there is a similar situation in the church in 2 Thessalonians, where we've talked about this, this misunderstanding of the coming of the Lord, which led to uh, lots of misunderstandings, and then ultimately it led to some confusion and, and, and things that happen in the life of the church. So what can happen oftentimes is that wrong information, wrong understanding, and wrong belief can lead to uh, wrong living. Another way to say that is that what you believe directly impacts the way that you live. What you believe directly impacts the way that you Live And so when Paul writes this letter, he's writing to correct some things because what was happening is that they had a, a misunderstanding and it was causing a shift in the way that they were following Jesus, the way that they were living amongst one another as a church. And the same thing can happen today when we have our beliefs that are not right, which is why we, we talk about orthodoxy, right? We, we want to have right doctrine. We want to we believe rightly. That's important because Another word that we can use sometimes is orthopraxy. So our, we want to have right practice, but that, is, that comes from and stems from a right belief, right understanding of the Word of God. So it's important, important that we have time to dive into the Word. It's important that we have time to, to study His Word and that we come together in community to understand His Word rightly. And so that directly impacts the way that we, that we live. Uh, in the book of Ephesians, Paul spends the first half of the letter just correcting doctrine. Just talking about what it means to believe rightly, that this is who Christ is. This is what he's done for you. This is who you are in Christ. And all those things are foundational because then when he gets to chapter 4, he's like, therefore, because of all of these things, now walk in a manner worthy of that calling to which you've been called. So now live your life in a way that's consistent with who you are in Christ. And so what Paul is going to do in 2 Thessalonians, this chapter here, is now he's going to get really practical. He's going to spend some time on these people that are walking, and I'll, I'll, word, I'll word it this way, out, out of order with the, the teachings of the Lord Jesus. So beginning in verse 6, 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6. And Paul says, Now I command you, brothers, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you keep away from any brother or sister who's walking in idleness and not in accord with the tradition that you received from us. For you yourselves know that how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you, nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked day, night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you. And it was not because we do not have that right, but to give you in ourselves an example to imitate. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. For we hear that there are, among, there, there are some among you who walk in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus Christ to do their work quietly and to earn their own living. As for you, brothers, do not grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person and have nothing to do with him in order that he might be ashamed. Do not regard him, though, as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. Let's pray. Lord, I ask that you would take the, your word off the pages of scripture and that you would bring us clarity and understanding and that we would correct our lives in light of the truth. Oftentimes, Lord, I think in our lives we try to, we try to do the other way around. We try to make your word fit in with the way that we want to live. But God, would you, would you transform us by your word? And would you help us not to point fingers this morning? but to look and examine at our own hearts as we walk through this passage. And Jesus, we love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. So there's a couple words that he has. First, we're going to say, Paul has a word to those who are 
orderly. We're, we'll call it that, and I'll, I'll explain why I'm calling it that in a minute. But they're walking in order. They're, they're walking consistently with who they are in Christ Jesus and the teachings of the, the apostles and what they have received from the Lord. So they're walking in that way, and so he's going to, he's going to give them some encouragement. He's going to give them some warnings and things to look out for. And the first thing he's going to tell them is to watch out for the disorderly. To watch out for the disorderly. He says, I command you to keep away from any brother who's walking in idleness. So, so who is he talking about? we got to understand that. Who is he talking about? Well, the word idle, some of your translations might say idle or might say irresponsible or might say um, lazy or might say disorderly. Literally, it means to be without order. Uh, it, it's to live in a disorderly manner, to be idle or lazy reckless or irresponsible. So the word originally was used uh, in the military. So it was a military term that was used to describe a soldier who was behaving outside of his rank or his order. So there was an order that a soldier would receive, and then he would either choose to listen and obey and follow that in consistent and in order, or he would go his own way. And so occasionally you'd have a soldier who just Went AWOL, did their own thing. I'm going to do my own oars, I'm going to go my own way, I'm going to do my own thing. And so there was a word, and that was refer, referring to them as being, uh, as being out of order, reckless, irresponsible, or, or idle. So I, I was talking to Stephen Davis this past week, and uh, he was telling me a story. In 2011, he was serving in Afghanistan, and he was in charge of... The, these different squadrons, um, and, and they had different posts and different responsibilities that were very, very important to the nature of what they were doing there in Afghanistan. One of them was that they would have teams that would go out on patrol every day in different streets, and they would patrol the streets and make sure that things were safe, make sure that the enemy wasn't you know, closing in on their camp. And so uh, one of Stephen's roles and responsibilities was to ensure that his squadron was doing their job, paying attention, making sure that everything was all right. So he would make his rounds, and he had a radio. And he said one day, he said, we, I was making my radio calls to make sure that everybody was on post and doing what they were supposed to do. And one guy didn't respond. So Stephen tried again, tried again. And he, sure enough, he would never respond to his, to his call. So Stephen went to where his post was, climbed up in, uh, in, in this little um, uh, tower to where he was, and found that he was completely asleep, like he was just sleeping on the post, to which Stephen, you know, I mean, he got right up to him, which anybody could have done that, um, and, and he said, he said, now, here's what I did, now, if you know Stephen, um, he said, I picked him up, and I slammed his head against the wooden block that was in front of him, like, wake up, like, you, like you realize what you did. And he said, um, he said, here's what's so crazy, that is that he had, at that moment that he was sleeping, there was a patrol that was hitting out, and his job was the main gate that they were hitting in. And oftentimes what would happen is that the enemy would come in behind them and lay down these, these, uh, these bombs in the street that, so that when they would come back to camp, they would blow them up. He had that one job, to make sure that nobody was going to come out behind them and set these, um, these road bombs these landmines, right? He, he missed what he was called to do. And Stephen was saying, do you understand that these men trusted their lives to you? And here you are sleeping on the post. You, you have, the, the word that Paul would use here is that you've, you've been reckless, you've been irresponsible, you've been idle in what you were called to do. And Paul's going to have a very strict, and there's, it's a very important, like he, there's a really like serious charge that he's going to give to the church. Now, like, we're probably not going to slam people's heads against, you know, the post, uh, Stephen, but we have a call. And he's going to give us a very specific way that we are to respond to believers who are not walking consistent with who they are in Christ. So there's a seriousness to what we call idleness. Now, idleness in itself is a sin, but it leads to other sins. Idleness leads to other things. You've heard the, the term before, uh, idle hands are a devil's playground. Have you heard that before? The, the Puritan Richard Baxter said it this way. He said that laziness is the devil's home for temptation. 
laziness is the devil's home for temptation because the truth is that nothing good happens when you're idle. We, we have to look no further than the Old Testament with King David. Remember the story in 2 Samuel chapter 11, it describes that there was a time when all the kings would go off to battle, and there's a really interesting word. It says, but King David stayed in Jerusalem. And then it says, while he was sitting there one day, laying on his couch, when he was supposed to be out doing his work, doing his job as king, he happened out on his uh, patio, he happens to look out, and then it says, the word in 2 Samuel chapter 11, you can look up, it says, and then it happened. He looks out and he sees a woman named Bathsheba bathing on the rooftop. And you know most likely the rest of the story. But happened as a result of him not doing, not doing the job that God had called him to do. Instead sat in idleness. And so we've seen that, uh, you can see story after story of things that happen as a result of a life that is not lived out in consistency with, with who God has called us to be. Idleness also implies a couple, a couple other things. One, it, it implies that there's nothing really worth me doing right now anyway. It's, it implies that there's nothing that's worth um, committing to. You, if you have teenagers, um, you've probably heard before, or just, I'm, I'm bored. There's nothing to do. I have nothing to do. Um, if you're a follower of Jesus, that's never true. There's never a moment when there's nothing for us to do. There's always something that we are called to. There's always something that God has called us to do. If, as long as people are lost in this world, church, there's always something for us to do. There's always the gospel that needs to be proclaimed. There's always hurting people that need to be tended to. There's always things that God is calling you and me to do. So if we're ever in a moment where we're like, you know, I just don't have anything to do, that we just, all we got to do is say a quick prayer to the Lord. Hey, Lord. What is it in this moment right now that you want me to do? Who is it that I can encourage? Who can I reach out to? Who can I go in? Who, who's it, who needs uh, some, some help right now in this moment? Maybe it's just time to spend with Jesus. But there's always something for us to do. So Paul, he's going to give us some more instructions in a minute on what exactly, specifically we are to do. But he tells the, the church to be aware of those who are walking in idleness. And I think we should also say... Be careful that idleness doesn't creep up in our own lives as well. And then he says to something else. He says to set the example. Set the example. So look at verses 7 through 9. It says, For you yourselves know how you ought to imitate us, because we were not idle when we were with you. Nor do we eat anyone's bread without paying for it. But with toil and labor we worked night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. And so... When Paul says, I was with you, I wasn't idle, I was, I was working, I worked hard. We, we saw that in 1 Thessalonians as well, that he, he was a hard worker, day and night, striving not to be a burden to, to anyone. And the truth is this, is that work is a good thing. Like, we, right now, we need to kind of just accept that. I know I work, sometimes we think, oh man, you know, work is a, as a, as a result of the fall, but it's actually not. In fact, if you look at the very beginning in the Genesis, God created man and he set him in a garden and he said to cultivate it and keep it. He gave him a job. So work is actually a good thing that God has given us to do. In fact, and maybe we need to all hear this for a moment, is that your job right now, whatever it is, your job is spiritual. Right, right now, you might say, oh, I'm just, a, I'm just this or I'm just that. No, you're not just anything. You're doing what God's called you to do, and it's a good thing. And so your, your work is spiritual. In fact, one of the most important ways that you show honor and glory to God is through your work. Like all of us, we have a responsibility. Whether your work is in the home or your work is outside the home, whether your work is in, you know, in a sewer or in a hospital, like your job is important, and it's how we show honor to our Lord Jesus. Colossians 3, 17 says, and whatever you do, so fill in the blank with whatever you do, but whatever you do, in word or in deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. And then verse 23 says, and whatever you do, work heartily as for, as a, as for the Lord, not for men, and know that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Jesus. 
So in your job, listen, whether, whatever, when, when you're teaching, when you're, when you're laboring, whatever it is that you're doing, you're called, I'm called to do that as unto the Lord. So our jobs are inherently spiritual. It's a good thing. It's a good thing for us to work. Which I think is why, one reason why he has to address those who won't. Those who are unwilling to take responsibility and, and do what God's called them to do. In verse 9 he says, it's not because we don't have that right. So what he's actually speaking to is that, so Paul worked a side job or a full-time job in, in the same time he was trying to share the gospel and plant this new church. He did so for a couple of reasons, but one is that we see through other places in Scripture that it's okay for a pastor, uh, for a missionary, for a leader, to, for that to be their job. Like, it's okay. In fact, there's some places where Paul says, he encourages the church, like, even commands churches, make sure you take care of your pastors, make sure you take care of your leaders. Uh, like, that's, a, that's, a, that's an important job to make sure that they, you know, are taken care of. Uh, now, that can also be abused, right? Uh, Brother Frank sent me a a video uh, this past week where basically a pastor was reprimanding his church for not buying him an expensive watch that he wanted. Maybe you saw the, the, the video. He was, just, he was just going to town, chewing them out because they wouldn't buy him a watch. Um, now, I don't know his whole story, and I've since seen that he's repented and he's apologized to his church family because of that. Um, but that's, that's an abuse of what, what Paul is talking about here. What Paul is saying is, that, yeah, I might have had the right to say, hey, support me while I work hard here. Um, but he said, I didn't want to be a burden. Like, I, I don't want to be a burden to you because there's something that's bigger at stake. And so I'm going to work really, really hard so that we can invest in what God's doing here in Thessalonica. And, in fact, it, it also could be that Paul knew that there were some, real, there were some people that were po truly poor and truly in need that he wanted that to go towards instead of himself. And so he was just, he worked so that they wouldn't be a burden. Not that he, he didn't have that right, but so in order that he would not be a burden. But also to set the example. He says, I put in you uh, to, to give yourself an example to imitate. So also he saw probably people in the church that weren't, they weren't living rightly, they weren't working, they were, um, they were instead, uh, they were, um, Laying aside their personal responsibility and relying on the faith and the generosity of others to, to live. And Paul said, no, that's, that's not right. That's an abuse of what, who we are as the church. And so he set the example for what it means to, to live. And I, I think this is a heavy part when it says to be the example, to set the example. Um, as I think about that in my own life and as a, as a shepherd... I have to ask myself a couple of questions like, okay, so am I living a life that I would want others to imitate? And we have to ask that same question as well. Are we living lives, church, that we would want others to imitate? Like if, if, if everybody loved my, their wife like I loved my wife, would we have healthy marriages in our church? If everyone worked at their job like I work at mine, would we, would we be, have a good reputation in our church? community if everyone loved their kids like I love my kids like how would our families be like we have to ask ourselves those questions and so I was talking to a group of pastors this week and it's and we were all just kind of like oh like that's that's a really like that's really heavy and in fact we have to confess that we don't always meet that standard right and so then the best thing that I can do as a pastor is model repentance and confession, say, hey, like there's a lot of times that I don't honor my wife like I should. There's a lot of times that I don't treat my kids and speak to them the way that I should. There's a lot of times that I, that I don't live up to these things. And so all I could do is say, like, I, I need the grace of God every single day to do in me what I can't do for myself. And so I can model what it means to be, to be humble before the Lord and confess my sin. And because that's where we all have to live. That's where we all have to be. And so he says, I set the example. So we need to set the example as well in the way that we work, the way that we live, the way that we shepherd, the way that we lead and teach and work and live to those that are around us and watching us. And now Paul is going to transition. He's going to give a word to those who are disorderly, those who are he's going to specifically address this group of people. So beginning in verse 10, he says, now, for even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not 
eat. For we hear that there are some who are walking in idleness, not busy at work, but busy bodies. Now such persons we command and encourage in the Lord Jesus to do their work quietly and earn their own living. So the first thing he's going to tell these disorderly people is to fulfill your responsibility. Fulfill your responsibility. So we have a responsibility to, to work hard, to fulfill the obligations that, that God has entrusted to us, whether it's providing for your families or working hard at your job or whatever it is that God has, uh, responsibilities that God has given you. I think it's interesting, though, that he says, when I was with you, I gave you a rule. I gave you this rule um, that if a man is not willing to work, let him not eat. Now, in my mind, I don't know about y'all, that shouldn't have to be a rule, right? Didn't, doesn't that just sort of make sense? Like, if you don't work, then you're not going to have anything to provide for your family. Like, that seems to me, like at face value, that that would just kind of, like, make sense. If you completely ignore your responsibility, uh, then you're not going to be able to take care of what God has entrusted to you. What Paul is going to say is very careful, because here's what was happening. Evidently, there was people that were in the church that were taking advantage of generosity of others. So we know that we are called as a church to love and care and, and help. And our church does a great job of that. Here's a quick example. Like, last, two weeks ago, I said, uh, we brought a bunch of book bags up here. We didn't give, a, even it's an email, we didn't give a warning. I was talking to Jessica, and I was like, like, I don't know how many of these we're going to get rid of. We're just going to throw them out here, and we're just going to see what happens. I think we put 50 book bags out and just said, if you can grab a book bag um, and fill it up with school supplies for families that are in need and just bring it back next week, then that would be really helpful. And I saw some of you guys like grabbing like six and seven backpacks. They're like, oh, let's go. Let's get out of here. And, we, and they were all gone. And then some people were like, hey, where's all the book bags at? Like, I, wanna, I wanted to help. And I'm like, sorry, they out helped you, so you couldn't help. Um, but it was, it was incredible to see the generosity that was flowing out of th this church family. Uh, and that's just one example of, of helping people that are outside the church. But then when we see people help one another inside the church, it's a, it's a beautiful thing. And that's what we're called to. But Paul says, but there are some that are walking in idleness and taking advantage of the generosity of the church. And he specifically says, if, if there's those people, then we are called to not enable and help them continue to live that sort of, of lifestyle. There are some people who take advantage and specifically say, I'm, going to, I'm not going to do what I know I'm supposed to do, and then I'm going to expect someone else to take care of me. And Paul says, no, that's not healthy. We're not going to be, we're not okay with that. Why? Because that's not good for them. It's not good for their heart. It's not good for their, and so that's why he's going to give us some instructions here and in, in what we specifically are to do um, about it. But he says, to, first of all, they need to fulfill their um, their responsibility. And yes, we help. And yes, there are those who are genuinely hurting and genuinely in need. And we absolutely jump. And we, we jump in a hurry to help. Unless they are ones who are walking in idleness and reckless and, uh, and, um, and not consistent with who we are in Christ. 1 Timothy 5.8 5, 5, 8 says, If anyone does not provide for their relatives or especially for their own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So church, we are responsible. We're responsible for what God has entrusted to us. We have to take that responsibility seriously. The second thing he's going to tell them is to focus on their work. Focus on, and I'm going to emphasize here, focus on your work. Focus on what God has called you to and entrusted you to. So not only were there some in the church that were being disorderly, they were also being disruptive. And this is interesting because Paul gives an interesting word here. So he says, there are some among you who are not busy at work, but are busy bodies, right? You see that? I think the CSB uh, says, not working, but interfering with the work of others. So he's, he's doing a play on words here. So basically he's saying, you're not busy in your own work, you're busy in everybody else's work. And so what was happening then is that since people were using their spare time, hey, they're going to take care of me, they're going to feed me, they're going to take care of me, so now I'm going to use the rest of the time that I have when I should be working, providing for my family, and I'm just going to meddle in everybody else's life. 
And so I'm going to spend my time worried about everybody else and what they're doing or what they're not doing. And then I'm going to talk to everybody else about what they're doing and what they're not doing. And this began to spread throughout the church. And Paul is saying that's a very dangerous thing that happens. In fact, if you, um, well, I won't go into specifics, but there's, there's people in this room who have seen, who've seen churches crumble as a result of people meddling in other people's affairs and not concerned for their own things. And ministries have fallen apart and churches have split and things have happened as a result of just a few people who are um, meddling in the affairs in the lives of, of other people. So it's a, so it's a big it's a big deal. And so Paul says there are people that are in the church that are not acting in order. They're not, they're not producing what we're called to produce. You, you ever been to a, um, to a vending machine and you're excited about getting your Snickers bar or whatever? And uh, you go and you're about to put the money in. You see a little sticker on the thing that says out of order. You ever, been that, you ever seen that happen? Yeah. Um, what it's saying is that this is not functioning properly. It's not going to produce what you hope it's going to produce right now. It's supposed to spit you out a Snickers bar. It shouldn't be a Snickers bar. A, a healthy granola snack. Uh, almonds. Almonds. We'll go with that. It's supposed to give you a pack of almonds. Instead, it's giving you nothing. All right, let's do it this way. You ever waited in line at McDonald's, and you get all the way through there, and you're so excited about the ice cream cone that you're about to get, and you say, uh, hey, I like an ice cream cone, and they say, oh, I'm sorry. The ice cream machine is out of order, and everybody has experienced that because it never works at McDonald's. I'm sorry. If you own a McDonald's, like, let's talk, please, because... I have to always go home with sad kids because the ice cream machine is always out of order. But what's the problem? It's not producing what it's supposed to be producing. That's what Paul is saying. There are believers in the church that are not, they're not, they're not acting out who they are in Christ. And because of that, it, it's a detriment to the entire church body. All right, so then finally, all right, so then what do we do about this? Because we could talk about it. Right? But what, is, what, is it, what are some action steps that he gives us? And he gives us some specific ones. So verse 13, he says, As for you, brothers, don't grow weary in doing good. If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of him and have nothing to do with him that he might be ashamed. But don't regard him as an enemy, but warn him as a brother. The first thing he says is don't grow weary because of them. Don't grow weary because of them. Um, so when I was growing up, our, our home church um, sponsored some ministries in India. And we, I don't know how we got connected with them. I don't remember all the details. I just remember that we were helping. And so we started raising money to build this church building in India. And then we started getting pictures. And there was this really big, beautiful, like, church building. And there was this, they, they put this plaque. Once we had sent, I mean, a lot of money there. They put this plaque in front of it and said, thank you, you know, uh, Rainbow Forest Baptist Church for your, you know, your partnership. Thank you. This, this is your building that you built. And so, you know, they showed the church. And I was always like, you know, again, I was a teenager. And I was like, this is really cool. That's so, man, that's really great. Well, it just so happened that we had a, uh, somebody from the church who was going to be in India and decided, hey, we're going to drive over and see the building that we helped be a part of. And they got there and it said, Thank you, Beulah Springs Baptist Church, for the building that you have put here. And they were like, well, that's really odd. This is the building. And then come to find out, they had scammed 30, 40-some churches into giving them money for this building. All they were doing is just taking the sign down, putting a new sign up. Taking the sign down, putting the new sign up. Um, and for me, as a young, impressionable teenager, like that... That really did something to me. In fact, it made me very skeptical of anybody who would say, hey, we're going to build this. There's a, there's a genuine need, and it was a genuine need. But for me, I was like, I don't think I want to help. Because what if they're just going to do this, or what if they're just going to do that? What if they're just going to take advantage? And if you've helped anybody, if you're in the room and you've helped anybody for any length of time, there's a chance that, that you've at some point gotten taken advantage of. Right? They've, maybe they've hurt you in some way. Or maybe there was a, you, you thought you were helping something and it ended up being that they were just pulling the wool over your eyes. They actually, and, and, and when you go through life and you help people, it's going to happen. 
And what Paul is saying is, listen, there are people who are going to abuse it, but what I'm telling you is don't grow weary in doing good. Like, don't let those few prevent you from fulfilling what God's called you to do. And that's hard sometimes, but that's what we're called. So, okay, we have to guard our own hearts. All right, Lord, like, I'm not, ultimately I'm doing this for the Lord. I'm not even doing this ultimately for them. I'm doing it for the glory of God. And so as the Lord leads, I'm going to give. As the Lord leads, I'm going to help. And I'm going to trust him. And I want to use wisdom in that. And so we're, even at, at Hope Valley, we, we help people, um, and we want to keep helping people. But we try to exercise wisdom when we're, when we're doing that. So that we're actually helping and not hurting or not perpetuating a, a problem. So one, don't grow weary. Don't grow weary in doing good. So Paul says, keep doing it. Like, keep giving. Keep doing good. It's what I've called you to do. But then he says another thing. He says, don't participate with them. Don't participate with them. So in verse 6 and verse 11, he talks about uh, keeping away from. The idea is to remove intimate fellowship with, right? To remove intimate fellowship with. Here's, here's what that looks like. It's not full-on church discipline. He, he, he lays that out differently in different passages. Here's what he's saying. It's lovingly going before a brother or sister and saying, listen, you are not walking consistent with who you are in Christ, and you're walking down a road that I can't walk with you in. So I'm telling you out of love that I'm, I'm going to withdraw this aspect of our relationship because it's not right and I can't participate with that maybe it's when you hear somebody that is meddling in the affairs of other people and getting involved in spreading rumors or talking and and gossiping and and it's you saying hey listen like I love you very very much but I'm not going to participate in this conversation right now Um, frankly what you're talking about is not my business and it's not a prayer request even though you've said it is and we're just gonna I'm I'm not going to participate in that so he says, don't participate in it. Don't, don't join them in that. And that's why he takes this so seriously, because he knows what it will do in the life of a church. So ultimately what he's telling us here, uh, as we walk through this, into this passage, as we, as we conclude this passage, he's saying, like, don't waste your life as an idle Christian. Don't, don't live your life wasting it when there's so much that God has called us to do. Don't live our life trying to, uh, to push aside what God, the responsibilities that God has entrusted to us and take advantage of other people in the church or, or forget what God has called us to. Don't waste your life being an idle Christian. So, when my dad was in college, uh, he went to college actually at Bluefield College just down the road. Uh, a book came out, a, a, a end times prophecy book that was really popular in that day, and he was uh, now again all of his friends, all of his, they were all reading it in the dorm room, and everybody was kind of getting all into it, and getting excited about. Oh man, this could be it! Like it was sort of one of the signs of the times types of books, and it was like, hey, Jesus is coming. In fact, he's probably coming like right now. It's going to happen any moment. And so my dad said it, it had different effects on different people. So for, um, for a group of my dad's friends, uh, it had the effect of, um, uh, well, well, if Jesus is coming, well, then none of this actually even matters anymore. And so he had a whole group of friends that just like just quit everything. Like they just stopped. He said he had a buddy, like one of his close friends, who just stopped going to class. <clears throat> and he was like, Dude, what are you doing? Like, you got to go to class. Like, no, Jesus is coming. Like, today, what are you doing? You're wasting your time. We could be hanging out and, like, fellowshipping. And, and so my dad just, like, watched him as he flunked out the entire semester because he didn't go to class. He didn't take his test. He didn't turn his papers in because Jesus was coming really, really soon. It had the opposite effect, though, on my dad. So my dad read the very same book with the very same um, the, the very same teaching that Jesus Christ is coming soon. And it drove my dad and it compelled him to say, okay, whoa, if Christ is coming, I've got work to do. Like there's so many people right now that are lost and dying and on their way to hell and I've got to tell them about it. And so then that like helped steer the direction of my dad's life and he has not stopped running ever since. And if you know my dad, he goes anywhere and everywhere, the door will open the door because, where God opens the door because he wants to tell people 
that they need Jesus. And there's no hope outside of Jesus. And so he spreads the gospel all over the world. We laugh sometimes because he gets back from one trip and he starts talking. Hey, I got this. I heard about this. I can't wait. I'm going to go over here. And hey, I got a, I got a message from my Pakistani friends. When can we get over there? And it's, that, that's just what drives him. Because Jesus is coming soon. And so then we have a job to do as a church. We don't have time to be idle and sit and, and get, get involved in stuff that just doesn't even really matter. We have a job to do as a church. Are we going to do it? Are we going to answer the call that God has placed on every single one of our lives? Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, as we think about this passage, as we think about the calling that you have placed on every single one of us, to be your ambassadors, to live for eternity, to not waste a single moment of our lives. Lord, I don't, I don't want to get to the end and have wasted the life that you've given me. Lord, I pray if there's someone in the room right now, maybe they're living a life and they're like, you know what, I, I've, just, I've just been spinning my tires. I've just been, I've just been wasting away my life. And I'm ready today to stop and start living for what truly matters. Lord, I pray that you would work in every single heart right now, as only you can, by your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. And church, if that's you, here's what I'm going to invite you to do. <clears throat> maybe there's moments, and there is, I shouldn't say maybe, there are moments for all of us where we get caught up in things that we shouldn't. We lose sight of who we are. We, um, we can grow idle. We can grow lazy. We can grow irresponsible. We can grow reckless. And so maybe the call for us right now is just to, to repent of those things and say, Lord Jesus, by your grace, I want to be who you call me to be. I want to live with the urgency that you've called me to live with. For those that are lost, for those that, are need, for those that need help. Or maybe it's you say, I've, I'm weary. I've grown weary in, in doing good. And so I just need to be re, uh, revived um, through the grace of Jesus and through his spirit this morning. Um, so w would you just stand with me right now? We're going to stand and we're going to sing together. Would you take a few moments? Maybe you want to kneel and pray. Or maybe you're here and you've been questioning all of this. Maybe you're questioning about how to have a relationship with Jesus. Like we exist as a church to point people to Jesus. That's why we're here. And so if you would say, I, I don't know that I know Jesus, like I'm going to be right here and I would love just to sit and talk with you. Um, there are so many others in this church that would love to sit and talk with you and point you to the hope that's only found in Jesus. So we pray that you wouldn't leave here with questions unanswered or burdens on your heart. Like you don't have to leave with those the things that you carried in here because of people that love you, people that care about you. So let's sing together. Let's have a moment to just open our hearts before the Lord. If you're troubled, heavy hearted, come to Jesus, say I find you
that you are um, a great God and Lord you don't need us in any way you don't need um, worker bees or slaves in order to get things done you could speak and make that happen but you've you've made us to reflect your image and bear your image and we know that you are an orderly creative wise God and when we see order when we see ingenuity and creativity we see um, your nature reflected and uh, Lord work in our hearts to where you would develop an appetite within us to reflect your character reflect your nature um, and to work intently um, in ways that you've skilled us and gifted us and developed us Um, help us to keep a a loving heart um, a compassionate gracious perspective um, on those around us and at times we all need that same compassion and grace Thank you that you extend that when we need it. Give us wisdom and discernment as we steward the resources that you've allowed in our lives um, that we are over in in different areas, whether it's our personal finances or on the job. Um, Give us wisdom and discernment in those areas, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you be seated just for a moment, please? Again, it is so good to see everybody today. Um, we appreciate, we love you. Thank you, Pastor Jared, for uh, teaching and handling that passage. Fantastic. Um, we are thankful, again, for your impact and your participation with the, the book bags that have been donated. We appreciate that. And we have another opportunity. This coming week, uh, this coming Friday, we are, uh, Hope Valley is going to feed the football team at Christiansburg. And as you can imagine, uh, a bunch of teenage boys, that takes a lot of food, right? Um, And uh, we do need some help. I have here a meatloaf pan. Could you ever guess what in the world you would do with a meatloaf pan? Well, I've got this one and about 19 more on that back table back there. And we need some help cooking some meatloafs this week. Um, So if you could help with that, uh, grab one, two, or three, or more of these pans, and uh, help us make some meatloaf, and you can get that back to me uh, somehow, either uh, on Thursday evening or Friday afternoon, that would be great. Um, Just, you can contact me through text or email, and uh, just gotta have it back by 2.45 on Friday, so, because we're gonna feed them at three o'clock, and we're gonna have a handful of people that are gonna be able to go over there, and uh, just hang out with these teenage guys and some of the coaches and stuff and build relationships. It's a great opportunity um, that the Lord's kind of just flung into our lap in the last couple days, and um, we can really uh, appreciate or uh, need, and we appreciate your help with that. Um, A few other things to mention. We have Fall Festival that's coming up at the end of September, September 25th, I believe is the date on that. Um, and uh, that was a great time last year. We had about 400 uh, people from the community come, and we were expecting like one or 200 last year. And uh, so we're hoping that the Lord would bless like that again. And that requires a lot of helping hands. Uh, so uh, I think Jared, Pastor Jared said last week, it's all hands on deck, and that is, that's definitely true. Um, but it was a, a tremendous blessing last year and uh, hopefully a blessing in the lives of those that that come. Uh, We get to build relationships, share the gospel, and I hope you set that aside on your calendar, and that would be a a big help. And we'll be giving out some more information about that, just how you can help and what exactly that'll look like. Um, Tonight, the puppet ministry uh, for kids has gotten uh, fired back up, so they'll be meeting tonight at 4.30 uh, downstairs. And then the Connect team will also be meeting tonight at the same time, somewhere in the building. Uh, The Fellowship Hall is kind of a construction zone right now, um, but they'll be meeting somewhere. Um, 
And by the way, we, we really appreciate everyone that's been helping with the fellowship hall. Um, we're trying to update back there. So we have uh, a nice uh, multi-purpose room that can be used as overflow on the big Sundays that we have, um, but also for minis- uh, other ministry purposes. We have uh, the youth ministry has really grown uh, and and there's a need to kind of split up middle schoolers and high schoolers on on Sunday evenings and that'll be part of that and so thank you for everybody that's uh, participating and helping serve with that and if you have some time to serve in some way come see myself come see Pastor Jared and uh, we'll set you up with something to do for sure Um, and then man camp is coming up here in just a few weeks uh, the weekend of the 9th and 10th uh, that'll be up here at Fithian Farms and then on that Saturday uh, we're going to help out the Fithians with clearing the trail a little bit for the Haunted Trail that takes place in October and uh, it'll be a, a great ministry opportunity as well I think that's everything that I have to mention but please be in prayer for all the different outreach things that we have going on this fall fall is my favorite time of the year anyways but um uh, it is probably the busiest time for us when it comes to outreach and evangelism opportunities that, the, that God has opened some amazing doors. And uh, we, we pray and ask that you would be participating in those things as the Lord uh, opens those doors for, for you as well. Uh, would you stand back to your feet? Thank you for being here today. Um, hope we get to talk with you on the way out. Um, and let's close today by worshiping the Lord. In my heart, in my heart, there's a fire burning, a passion deep within my soul, not slowing down, not growing gold. An unquenchable flame that keeps burning for being here and have a good week.